This is the Monday, December 25th, 2017 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new episode every Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello, history lovers. Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. Since our usual Monday appointment falls on Christmas Day, we wanted to do something special. So we're sharing a 1939 episode of the Campbell Playhouse. It's a radio production of A Christmas Carol. Hosted by Orson Welles and starring Lionel Barrymore as Ebenezer Scrooge. Lionel was the eldest of America's top stage family, which included his brother John and sister Ethel. He talks about performing this very play with them as children when Mr. Wells speaks to him at the end of their broadcast. This is the closest we could come to giving you all a real gift. And since we have this legendary director interviewing this legendary actor, we're sticking within the programming format, having a guest host who gave us Citizen Kane, War of the Worlds, and his final role as the planet-eating robot Unicron in the 1986 Transformers animated film. When Charles Dickens published A Christmas Carol in 1843, he did so as what we'd call social commentary reflecting the soul-searching of his fellow Britons at the time. What did the holiday that celebrated the birth of Christ in its name really mean, as it absorbed new traditions, such as Christmas trees? Was it a season of festivity and joy, or of the solemn, glum observances synonymous with the Victorian era? 175 years later, we could see the importance of Dickens' central themes in our own world, where so many TV shows have parodied the story in a medium that would have been completely mind-blowing to the people in the 1840s. Of course, in the 1930s, when Wells welcomed Barrymore in his show, TV had just appeared on the scene. It wasn't anything like the magic HD panels at your favorite sports hangout, and since nothing was available on demand, it would be half a century before video killed the radio star and what radio stars they had in those days. Wells and Barrymore took to the mic, and they transformed people, painting pictures and whole worlds with their words. The AM band was the internet, television, smartphone, and national newspaper, all stuffed into a piece of furniture that sat in the corner, inviting the family to gather around, and paving the way for stars to perform in any living room that could suck in the signal. Those warm, humming, glowing vacuum tubes provided an escape from the Great Depression and plugged listeners into the world far beyond what they could see. And like the Super Bowl or WPIX Yule Log here in the New York City area, radio had its traditions. One was Lionel Barrymore performing the infamous Miser Scrooge, haunted by ghostly apparitions, warning that he'd better get his act together and find salvation. Barrymore first played Scrooge from the radio studio in 1934 and returned every December except two, including this that we're going to play today, his sixth performance and one of only half a dozen known to still exist, until he passed away just before Christmas 1954. As modern listeners know, Lionel Barrymore also features in a great television Christmas tradition as the miserly Mr. Potter 
in Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life. It often surprises people to hear that that film didn't do great at the box office in 1946. Having just witnessed the carnage of the Second World War, I guess the upbeat message about life tasted a little bit flat. But I like to think of the people sitting in the balcony as the house lights dim in those great big old theaters, eager to be swept away by a new silver screen visit from their favorite holiday guest, as he delivered what to them would have clearly been a modern reimagining of Scrooge. In time, America grew to love the film deeply. Confined to a wheelchair like the character he portrayed, Barrymore's performance earned him the number six slot on the American Film Institute's list of the 50 greatest villains in the history of American cinema. Incidentally, Frank Capper based It's a Wonderful Life on a short story titled The Greatest Gift by my fellow Rutgers alumnus, Philip Van Dorn Stern. After trying unsuccessfully to sell what's actually an alternate history story far ahead of its time, Stern self-published and stuffed copies of the book into the 200 Christmas cards he sent in 1943. A few months later, Stern received a Western Union telegram from RKO Radio Pictures. Maybe in my very office over Radio City Music Hall, then an RKO jewel adorned with its logo. The telegram was an offer to purchase the greatest gift for $10,000, over $140,000 in today's money. And it's nice to know that Mr. Stern lived until 1984, long enough to see his story starring Jimmy Stewart as George Bailey become as much a part of the holiday season as a Christmas carol itself. Okay, now that we've climbed up on the housetop, click, 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 let's drop down through the chimney with Orson Welles, Lionel Barrymore, and Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol. Christmas Carol could be introduced. Myself, I am most struck by the happy fortune that enables us on this Christmas Eve to present Mr. Lionel Barrymore, the best-loved actor of our time, in the world's best-loved Christmas story, A Christmas Carol. It is the American way, as we know, to establish traditions quickly where popular instinct and sentiment pronounce them sound. And so it is that today, actually, only the fifth anniversary of Mr. Lionel Barrymore's first playing of the part of Ebenezer Scrooge for the Campbell Playhouse, there is, I think, in all America, nothing more eagerly awaited, more firmly rooted in the hearts of the radio family that numbers millions that this yearly performance of A Christmas Carol. A Christmas Carol, as Charles Dickens wrote it, has by common consent long been a classic Mr. Lionel Barrymore's appearance in it is rapidly becoming one. Marley was dead to begin with. There's no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it. And Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. 
Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did. Scrooge and Marley were partners for I don't know how many years. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone with Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Once upon a time, of all the good days in the year, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house, a grim, cheerless place if ever there was one. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open, that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, Bob Cratchit, who in a cold and dismal little cell beyond worked at his ledgers. 19, 20, 21, 22. Merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. 23, 26, 29. It's mistake. 11, 13, 17, 7, carry one. Power and save one. Bob Cratchit. Yes, Mr. Scrooge. Stop that infernal cackle, Yes, sir. 15, 17, 21, carry Impudence. Singing their idiotic Christmas carols at my very door. Go somewhere else and bellow your blasted carols, or I'll give you in charge. Sorry, Governor. It's an old song for Christmas time, you know. Yes, and I don't want any of your old customs. Take your fellow fools and go away. Christmas. Blah. Right, sir. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Uncle. Merry Christmas, Bob. Merry Christmas, Mr. Fred. God save you, Uncle. Ah, humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle? No, I'm sure you don't mean that. I mean just that. Exactly that. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What, what reason have you? You're bored enough. Well, what right have you to be dismal about Christmas, Uncle? You're rich enough. Ah. Now, Uncle, don't be cross. Well, what else can I be? When I live in such a world of fools. What's Christmas to you but a time for paying bills without money? Merry Christmas. A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips would be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. He should. Uncle? Have you... Keep your Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it, but you don't keep it, Uncle. Well, let me leave it alone, then. What do you want? A Christmas gift, I've no doubt. I came to wish you a Merry Christmas, Uncle. A Merry Christmas. Much good may Christmas do you. Much good it ever has done you. There are many things from which I derive good by which I have not profited materially, I dare say, Uncle. Christmas among the rest. But I have always thought of Christmas time as a good time. A kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. And therefore, Uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. God bless Christmas. Hurrah! Let me hear another sound out of you there, Bob Cratchit, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. As to you, nephew, I wonder you don't go into Parliament. You talk enough nonsense. Don't be angry, Uncle. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why can't we be friends? Good afternoon. Well, I'm sorry you feel that way. I've tried. A Merry Christmas to you, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year, too. Ah, humbug. And a Merry Christmas to you, Bob, and the missus, and to Tiny Tim. Thank you, Mr. Fred. Same to you, sir. Good day, sir. Good day, Bob. Nonsense. Twaddle. Blummery. Talking of Christmas and not two sixpences to jingle together in this trousers pocket. You there, Bob Cratchit. Come here. What are you doing there? I was only putting a bit more coal on the fire, Mr. Scrooge. Seeing it's so cold in there, sir. Well, you put that coal back into the scuttle. A fire. A fire, indeed. I can tell you, if you use coal at that rate, you and I will soon be parting company, Bob Cratchit. You understand that? There's many a young fella like your situation, you know. Well, I'm sorry, sir. My fingers were getting a little stiff with the cold. Then put on your mittens. There's someone at the door. See who it is. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. This is the firm of Scrooge and Marley. Yes, sir. I should like to see the head of the firm, if I may. Oh, very good, sir. What is it? A gentleman to see you, Mr. Scrooge. 
Huh? Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Marley's been dead these seven years tonight. I'm Scrooge. Well, now, Mr. Scrooge, at this season of the year, it's only fitting that we who are more fortunate should raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of want. You may not believe it, sir, but many thousands are now in want of common necessities. And hundreds of thousands are in want of the simplest comfort, sir. Uh, are there no prisoners? There are plenty of prisons, sir. And the workhouses, they're still in operation, I trust. I wish I could say they are not, but they are, sir. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigor, then? Both very busy, sir. Oh, well, I'm very glad to hear that. I was afraid from what you said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their useful cause. No, sir, all these institutions that you mention are flourishing. But it's nevertheless true that some additional provision for the poor and the destitute must be made. <laughs> A few of us upon change are endeavoring to raise such a fund, you see. And what shall I put you down for? Nothing. Oh, I see. You wish to be anonymous, sir. I wish to be let alone. I don't make merry myself at Christmas time, and I can't afford to keep a lot of idle people and make them merry. I help support the establishments that take care of the poor. They cost enough. Let those who are badly off go there. Many can't go there, sir. And many would rather die. Well, then, my advice to them is to do so and decrease the surplus population. Besides, I've only your word for it that all this is so. The truth, Mr. Scrooge. Well, so be it, then. It's not my business. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, sir. I quite understand, Mr. Scrooge. Cratchit, show this gentleman out. Yes, sir. This way, please. Sir, I couldn't help overhearing. I should like to contribute threepence. Cratchit! Yes, sir. It isn't much, but it's all I can afford. But there are others in worse situation than I. You're a generous fellow. I wish I might say so of your employer. Cratchit! Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Merry Christmas. Uh, Merry Christmas. Yes, sir. Merry Christmas. Close the door. Yes, sir. I have closed it, sir. 24, 31, 1 and carry 3. A new scarlet tippet for Tiny Tim. And a comb for Martha. 33, 3 and carry 3. Hair ribbon for Belinda. 4, 7, 12, 15. I suppose you want the entire day tomorrow. If it's quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient and it's not fair. But I suppose I can't do anything about it. If I was to stop half a crown of your wages, you'd think yourself very ill-used. I'd be bound. Well, sir, I... And yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work? It's only once a year, sir. Once a year. Once a year, indeed. A fine excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose it's no good talking. You must have the whole day. Well, see that you're here all the earlier the next morning. You understand? Oh, I will, sir. I will, sir, indeed. Good night, sir, and Merry Christmas. Ah. Merry Christmas! Ah. The office was closed in a twinkling, and Bob Cratchit, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no great coat, went down a slide on Corn Hill 20 times in honor of its being Christmas Eve, and then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play with his family at Blind Man's Buff. Scrooge, on the other hand, took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern. Having read all the newspapers and spent the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went to his dismal house. Darkness is cheap and Scrooge likes it. The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew its every stone, had to grope with his hands through the fog and the frost to find the door. Scrooge walked through his rooms to see that all was right. Sitting room? Bedroom? Lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa. Nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet. Closed the door. Locked himself in, double locked himself in. And took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap. 
and sat down before the fire to take his gruel. Mm. Uh, uh, mm. Uh, mm. Marley. 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 I could have sworn I saw... Oh, ah, humbug. Marley's been dead these seven years. Humbug. It's all humbug. What I need is a good night. <sighs> Outside my door. Ah, I won't believe it. There's humbug still. Ebenezer Scrooge. <laughs> Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh, no. What do you want with me? I want much of you, Ebenezer. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Well, you are very particular for a ghost. All right. Who were you, then? In life... I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Jacob Marley? But you're dead. You died seven years ago. Seven years ago this very night. You are a ghost, then? What's wrong, Ebenezer? Don't you believe in me? I do not. You doubt your senses, Ebenezer? Yes, because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You can't be a ghost. You, you may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. <laughs> there may be more gravy than grave about you, whatever you are. <laughs> humbug, I tell you. Humbug. <laughs> I do believe in you. You are a ghost, Jacob. Thank you. But what? Why do you walk the earth, Jacob? Why do you come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide to witness what it cannot share but might have shared on earth and turn to happiness. Oh, tell me, Jacob, what is that chain you wear around you? I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard by my own free will. Is its pattern strange to you, Ebenezer? Cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, purses. Yours was as heavy and as long as this seven years ago. You have labored on it since, Ebenezer. Oh, Jacob, speak comfort to me. Comfort I have none to give. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger. Weary journeys lie before me. You travel fast? Yes, Ebenezer. On the wings of the wind. Seven years dead and traveling all the time? Seven years, Ebenezer. Seven years of remorse. Ebenezer, do you know that no space of regret can make amends for one life's opportunities misused? But you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business? Mankind was my business. Charity, mercy, benevolence. They were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Oh, Jacob, don't take on so. Jacob. Listen to me, Ebenezer. I listen to you, Jacob. Go on, Jacob, speak to me. But don't be so flowery. Ebenezer, I am here to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. Do you hear that, Ebenezer? Yes, Jacob. You always were a good friend to me, Jacob. Thank you, Jacob. But go on. Go on. Go on. 
How shall I escape? Oh, I'm, I'm afraid, Jacob. You will be haunted by three spirits. Is that the only chance and hope, Jacob? It is your only chance and hope. Well, then I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow, when the bell tolls one. Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over, Jacob? Ebenezer, look that for your own sake you remember what has passed between us. And remember... When the bell tolls one, look for the first spirit. Marley. Jacob Marley. Scrooge awoke. He was lying on his bed fully dressed. Suddenly the curtains of his bed were drawn aside. Scrooge found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them. As close to it as I am now to you. And I am standing in the spirit at your elbow. It was a strange figure. Like a child. Yet not so like a child as like an old man. Ebenezer Scrooge. Who was that? Ebenezer Scrooge, I have come for you. You... You are the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold me? I am that spirit. Who, who, what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No. Your past. But... Oh, what do you want of me? What brings you here to haunt me? Your welfare, Ebenezer Scrooge. Rise and walk with me. Oh, no, 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 you're not out of the window. I can't do that. I'll fall down. I'm not a spirit. I'm mortal. I'll fall. Bear but a touch of my hand upon your heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. Come, follow me. What's become of the city? And there's snow upon the ground. Where are we? These are the shadows of the things that have been. You recognize this countryside? <gasps> oh, I know every inch of it. Every rock, every tree. And that bleak building over there? Ah, uh, that building. I was a boy there. Yes. I went to school in that horrible place. Do you recollect that path? I could walk it blindfold. Strange you forgot it so many years. Come, let us go closer. Look through the window into that cold, barren room. What do you see, Ebenezer Scrooge? I see a boy. A solitary child, neglected by his family, alone. Yes, yes, I see I know that boy. Oh, I was so lonely. Poor boy. Your lip is trembling, Scrooge. And what is that on your cheek? It's nothing. Nothing. Nothing at all. I wish I... Uh, it's too late for that now. What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing. The waits came to my door singing Christmas carols last night. There was a boy like that among them. A poor, thin, pale boy in a ragged coat. I'd like to have given him something. That's all. Is that all? Come, Ebenezer Scrooge. Let us see another Christmas. Do you know this place, Ebenezer Scrooge? Know it? Know it? Why, this is the counting house where I was apprenticed. Listen. Why, it's my old master. Bless his heart, old Fezziwig. My master, alive again. And host of one of his Christmas parties. <laughs> Listen to it. Red the needle. And back to your places. <laughs> 
And there's Dick Wilkins. Poor Dick. Dear, 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 yes. And look, there's Mrs. Fezziwig herself, looking younger than any of them. And the table's all loaded with roast and cider and mince pie and beer. Oh, what a jolly time we used to have. That carefree young man with the light heart and the gay smile. Do you recognize him? Yes, yes, yes. Merciful heaven. How happy I was then. A small matter for old Fezziwig to make those silly folks so full of joy. Small matter? Small indeed. Isn't it? He has spent only a few pounds of your mortal money. Is that so much that he deserves praise? Ah, it's not that. It's not that, spirit. Old Fezziwig has the power to make us happy or unhappy. To make our service light or heavy. His power lies in words and looks in things so tiny it's impossible to count them up. The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost her... What is the matter? Nothing. Nothing at all, Spirit. Something, I think. No, no, no. No. Only... It's just that I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk, Bob Cratchit, just now, that's all. My time grows short, and we have yet another journey to make. Where now? Come. This is our last visit to the past Ebenezer. Here, in this little room, with a fair young girl by your side. Do you recognize yourself, Ebenezer? Oh, no, 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 no. Spare me this. You are older now, a man in the prime of life. Your face has begun to wear the signs of care and avarice. Your eyes are greedy. The eager, restless eyes of a miser. No, no, please. She knows it, too. That girl by your side. There are tears in her eyes. It matters little, Ebenezer, to you. Very little. I know that. Belle, have I changed towards you? When we were engaged, we were both poor. Was it better, then? Better to be poor? Better, at least, to be happy. You're changed. You were another man then. I was a boy. Do you blame me because I've grown wiser? Have I ever tried to break our engagement? In words, no. Never. In in what then? In a changed nature. In an altered spirit. In everything that made my love of any value in your sight. So I release you from your promise. Belle. Oh, at first it may cause you pain to lose me. A very brief pain. But soon it will be dim, like a half-remembered dream. An unprofitable dream. And you will be glad to be awake from such a dream. May you be happy in the life you have chosen, Ebenezer. For the love of him you love. Spirit, it's enough. Show me no more. Take me home. These were shadows of the things that have been. That they are what they are. Do not blame me. No more. No more. One shadow more. Come. Do you see this man, Ebenezer Scrooge? This man might have been you. And the woman beside him, your wife. And that girl. That girl might have been your daughter, Ebenezer Scrooge. She might have called you father. She might have been a springtime in the haggard winter of your life. Please let me go. Show me no more. Listen now, while they speak, Ebenezer. I saw an old friend of yours today. Who was it? Yes. How can I? It's... Oh, I know. Mr. Scrooge. Mr. Scrooge it was. I passed his office window. It wasn't shuttered. And there was a candle inside, so I couldn't help seeing him. His partner, Marley, lies at the point of death, I hear. And there Scrooge sat all alone. Quite alone in the world, I do believe. Spirit, 
Spirit, I can bear no more. Leave me. Hold me no more. Take me back. Take me back. On the stroke of one, Scrooge awakened suddenly and sat him bolt upright in his own bed. He remembered the words of Marley's ghost and wondered from which direction the second specter would appear. At that moment, nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have astonished him very much. Now being prepared for almost anything, he was not by any means prepared for nothing. And consequently, when no shape appeared, he was taken with a violent fit of trembling. Five minutes, ten minutes, quarter of an hour went by, yet nothing came. Then as he sat in his bed, he became aware gradually of a great blaze of ruddy light that seemed to shine upon him from the adjoining room. He got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. It was his own sitting room, there was no doubt about that. But it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove. And there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it up, high up, to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the corner. Come in, come in, Ebenezer Scrooge, and know me better, man. You are... I am the ghost of Christmas present. Spirit, take me where you will. Last time I went against my will and learned a lesson which is working now. If you have anything to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe, Ebenezer Scrooge. Touch my robe. Where have you brought me, spirit? To an humble dwelling in an humble street. <laughs> it's miserable enough. Yet there is happiness there. Who are these people? Who's that woman and the children? These are the family of your clerk, Bob Cratchit. See his wife, dressed in a twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons, laying the table for their Christmas dinner. And there, assisting her, is her daughter, Belinda. And the young man with the fork in the stuffing, that's Master Peter Cratchit. And the two little Cratchits. Listen, Scrooge. And watch. Here's my Sit you down before the fire, Martha, and have a warm, Lord bless you. Where's Father? He's been to church with Tiny Tim. They'll be along directly. How is Tiny Tim, Mother? Any better at all? Sometimes I think he is. And sometimes I think, oh, dear God, if anything should happen to Tiny Tim. Oh, Mother, you mustn't even Here think of such a thing. Oh, oh, where's Father? Come here. Oh, Merry Christmas, Father. Tim. Merry Christmas, Martha. Oh, Tim, you darling. Oh, Father, I'm so glad to be home. And we're glad to have you, Martha. And how did little Tim behave in church, Bob? Uh, as good as gold and better. I like church, Mother. Oh, they sang the nicest songs. I hope people saw me there. Saw you there? And why, Tim? Well, don't you see? Because I'm lame. And if they saw my crutch, it might be pleasant for them to remember on Christmas who it was made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Bless you, my son. Are we ready to eat, Mother? Oh, yes, children, we're all ready. Come, come, take your places and wait your turn. There's plenty of stuffing and dressing and plum pudding for all of you. Martha, take care of Tiny Tim and see that he eats plenty. He must get strong and well. Now sit down, everyone. Yes, come on, Tiny Tim. And now, my dears. I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner. And a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. No, 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 kind spirit. Say he'll be spared. Say he'll live. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, Ebenezer, the child will die. And to praise thy name. Amen. Amen. And now, my dears, with such a dinner, a toast, a Merry Christmas to us all, and God bless us. Oh, God bless us, everyone. And now to Mr. Scrooge. 
I'll give you a toast to Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed, who pays you all of 15 shillings a week. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast on, and I hope he'd have good appetite for it. Oh, my dear, the children, Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Bob. Nobody knows it better than you, poor fellow. My dear Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake and the day's, not for his. Long life to him. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. And I say God bless him too, Mother, and everyone. Yes, I yes. Nothing of high mark in all this. They were not a handsome family, these Cratchits. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty and had known, very likely, the insides of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. And when at last they faded, Scrooge had his eye upon them. And especially on Tiny Tim until the last. Many calls Scrooge made that night with a ghost of Christmas present. Down among the miners they went who labor in the bowels of the earth. And out to sea among the sailors at their watch. Dark, ghostly figures in their several stations... Much they saw and far they went, and many places they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirit stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful, on foreign lands, and they were close at home, by poverty, and it was rich, in almshouse, hospital, and jail, where a vain man in his little brief authority had not made fast the door. And barred the spirit out, the spirit left his blessing. It was a long night. It was only a night. And it was strange, too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew older. Clearly older. My life upon this globe is very brief, Ebenezer. It ends tonight. Tonight? Tonight at midnight. Ah, the hour has come. Oh, not yet. Not yet. Now, there are still more things I wish to learn. These you will learn from still another spirit. Still another spirit, Ebenezer. <laughs> Scrooge looked about him for the ghost. It had vanished. He found himself once more in his bed, in his dressing gown, in his nightcap. He'd heard the clock strike. And then, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley. And lifting up his eyes, beheld the third spirit. A solemn phantom. Shrouded in black draped and hooded, coming towards him slowly and silently, like a mist along the ground. I know you. You, you are the ghost of Christmas yet to come. You'll show me the shadows of things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us. Answer me, spirit, ghost of the future. Oh, I fear you more than any specter I've seen. Yet, as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, lead on. Lead on! The night is waning fast. Time is precious. 
stupid it. Why have you brought me here again? Here to Bob Cratchit's home? It's not the same. Why is it so quiet? So very quiet here. Mother, please. Oh, my God. My little son. Don't you. I loved him so. Mother, dear, you mustn't. It's almost time for Father to be home. Don't let him see you crying. Yes. Yes, Martha. He's late tonight. He walks slower than he used to. Yet I've known him to walk very fast indeed with tiny Tim on his shoulder. So have I, Mother. But he was light to carry. And his father loved him so that it was no trouble. No trouble at all. Bob. Good evening, my dear. You're late, Bob. I'm sorry, my dear. I, I went to the churchyard today. I wish you could have gone with me. It would have done your heart good to see how sweet and green a place it is. You'll see it often. I promised him. I promised Tiny Tim we'd walk there on Sunday. Oh, Father dear, it's God's will, Bob. I'm trying to understand it, my dear. My son... My little son, Tiny Tim. And I loved him so. Oh, that's cruel. Cruel. Spirit, can't you give me one ray of hope that I may change all that? That Tiny Tim may live? shadows of things that will be, or, or are they the shadows of things that may be only? Will you not speak to me, spirit? What is that grave to which you point? <gasps> now I see. There's writing on that stone. The name on the gravestone is Ebenezer Scrooge. Ebenezer Scrooge. <gasps> No, no, no. Spirit, hear me. I'm not the man I was. Why show me this? If I'm past all hope, tell me that I may change these dreadful shadows that, that have come, that you've shown me by an altered life. I'll honor Christmas in my heart and I'll try and keep it all the year. I live in the past, the present, and the future. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Tell me, do, spirit. Please tell me that I can sponge away the writing on that stone, spirit. I beg of you, spirit. Spirit. What's this? It's my bedpost. I'm home. In my own bed. In my own room. And the sun. The sun shines. It's clear. It's bright. No fog. Oh, what a beautiful day. Glorious. Glorious. Boy. Oh, boy. Yes, sir. What's today? What's that, sir? What day is it, my fine fella? Today? Why, it's Christmas Day. Christmas Day. Ha, ha. 
the man, mister. The spirits have done it all in one night. All in one night. Heaven be praised. How's that, sir? Listen, my lad. Do you know where the poultry is in the next street? I should say I do. <laughs> An intelligent boy. A remarkable boy. Tell me, do you know if they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging in the window? The one as big as me? <laughs> What a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Yes, my buck? It's hanging there now, sir. Oh, that's wonderful. Now go around, will you, and tell him to send it to Bob Cratchit and his family on Broad Street. And mind you, they're not to know who paid for it. Now hurry along, my lad. And here, here, here's half a crown for your trouble. Yes, sir, yes, sir. <laughs> and a Merry Christmas to you, too, my boy. <laughs> oh, I don't know what to do. I'm as light as a feather, as happy as an angel. I'm as merry as a schoolboy. A Merry Christmas. A Merry Christmas to everybody. A Happy New Year to all the world. Whoop! Whoop! Next morning, Scrooge was early at his office. He went early for a reason. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he'd set his heart upon. And he did it. Yes, he did. The clock had struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come in. And at last he came. His hat was off before he opened the door. His comforter, too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen, as if he were trying to overtake 9 o'clock. 8 and 17 are 15. Carry the 1, 24. Carry the 2, 31. Carry the 4. 8 and 6 are 14. Carry the 8. Hello, you, Cratchit. Yes, sir. Step this way, Cratchit, if you please. Cratchit, what do you mean by coming in at this time of day? Oh, I'm... Very sorry, sir. I'm behind my time. You are? You are? Yes, I think you are. Oh, it's only once a year, Mr. Scrooge. It shall not be repeated. I was I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. I, I'll tell you what, my friend. I'll not stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, Bob Cratchit, I'm about to raise your salary. Mr. Scrooge, are you... Are you Quite yourself, sir? No. No. Thank heaven I'm not quite myself. Merry Christmas, Bob. <laughs> Merry Christmas, my good fella. A merrier Christmas than I've given you in many a year. I'll raise your salary and we'll see what we can do for Tiny Tim and the rest of your family. <laughs> we'll discuss it this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop. Bob! Make up the fire. Make it up and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another eye. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all, and infinitely more. To Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master... And as good a man as the good old city knew or any other good old city, town or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh and little heeded them. His own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards, and it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us. All of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare his
this point in the program, ladies and gentlemen, it is my custom, as you know, to present to you with a few words of introduction our guest of the evening. With your consent, I shall dispense with this tonight to introduce tonight's guest to the Campbell Playhouse audience or to any other American audience is an extravagant and superfluous procedure. For if ever an actor has won for himself a lasting place in the hearts of his fellow countrymen through years of unsparing and inspiring service... That actor is Lionel Barrymore. Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Thank you, Austin Wells. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is the fourth year I've had the pleasure of appearing in the Christmas Carol here on the Campbell Playhouse. And I assure you all, it's a pleasure that never tires. As long as I can remember, this has been one of my favorite stories. When we were children, it was read to us regularly at this time of year, as it is to millions of children right now. And like many of them, I'm sure, the three of us, Ethel, Jack, and I, with the aid of a sheet and some old ironware, made a play of it. As I remember, we had three Scrooges in that production. Mr. Barrymore, who played Tiny Tim? I think we had three Tiny Tims, too. But seriously... I can think of no part that I've enjoyed playing again and again as much as I have the part of that squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner, Ebenezer Scrooge. And I can think of no happier or more suitable choice for the makers of Campbell's soups to offer the people of America as their Christmas present each year than Charles Dickens' well-beloved story, Christmas Carol. Good night, Orson. Good night, everybody. And a merry, merry Christmas to you all. Good night, Mr. Barrymore. Merry Christmas to you, too. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the night before Christmas. And all through the Campbell Playhouse, not a creature is stirring that doesn't join Lionel Barrymore in wishing you a merry, merry Christmas. This goes for all of us, from my sponsor, from myself, from all of us, from Don McBain, who runs the machinery in the control room, to Miss Helgren, who types the Campbell Playhouse scripts. A Merry Christmas from Benny Herman and his band of Merry Melodians, Merry Christmas. You get the idea. From Max Sayers to uh, Torrance. And uh, from Harry Esmond and his crew of sound effects. Pictures. Thank you. And from Orson Welles and his considerable aggregation of dramatic talent, which includes, among others, Mr. Frank Reddick, Miss Georgia Backus, Miss B. Benaderet, Mr. Ray Collins, Mr. Everett Sloan, Mr. George Kalouris, Edgar Berry, Erskine Sanford, Tommy Lane, William Allen, Betty Lou Walters, Eric Burtis, myself, and George Spelvin. A Merry Christmas. How about it, ladies and gentlemen? A Merry Christmas. And finally, as Tiny Tim says... God bless us, everyone. Again, you've been enjoying a 1939 public domain episode of the Campbell Playhouse Radio Theater production of A Christmas Carol. Your host has been Orson Welles and starring as Ebenezer Scrooge, Lionel Barrymore. I hope you enjoyed listening to these two fabled performers, just as Americans generations ago would have. And now, something we don't usually do with our time machine... We'll look forward into the future. On January 1st, we'll be airing an interview with our sometimes guest host, Tom Grace, about his new novel, Undeniable. Book six in his thriller series featuring ex-Navy SEAL, Nolan Kilkenny. Join us in congratulating Tom on that publication at Tom underscore Grace on Twitter and Facebook.com slash author Tom Grace or you can pay him a visit at tomgrace.net. And a programming note. Starting in 2018, we'll be airing new episodes on the first and second Monday of each month, rather than weekly. But there are over 130 interviews in our archives now, with guests such as Candace Millard, Rinker Buck, and Lori Holtz Anderson, as well as History in Five Fridays, presented by Simon & Schuster, featuring top historians like David McCullough and Doris Kearns Goodwin. So you should never be at a loss for some great history talk. Well, that's it for this Yuletide installment of the History Author Show. 
I hope you'll join us for next Monday's all-new interview with Tom Grace right here on iHeartRadio. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please take a minute to leave us a review. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a very happy new year. The boys won the war and came home from the fight. The last night on Broadway was almost his night. But ever since then, it's a different street. Gone are the places where the gang used to meet. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.